Welcome to See You on the Other Side, where the world of the mysterious collides with the world of entertainment. A discussion of art, music, movies, spirituality, the weird, and self-discovery. And now, your hosts, musicians and entertainers who have their own weakness for the weird, Mike and Wendy from the band Sunspot. Episode 284, When Big Bird Attacks, Avian Death from Above. Yeah. Greetings, live (laughs) on location, Allison, my sister. Hey, everybody. And I are at the Best Western in Alton, Illinois. That's right. Beautiful Alton, Illinois. Yes. Live from the Dead of Winter Paranormal Event. Allison was a featured speaker at the Paranormal Event today. I was. And Allison, what'd you talk about? I talked about uh, paranormal wom- women, uh, hidden history. So talk like, about. So, like me, like paranormal women, like women that are just freaky. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, talk. I was talking about um, investigators. How female investigators have really been leaders in parapsychology and in paranormal investigation. Uh, since the 1800s, uh, but largely today they're unknown and their accomplishments and contributions to the field have been largely unsung. So, you know, many people don't even know the names of these people, whereas, you know, they know the name of Zach Baggins, right, but they don't know, you know, like who who brought who brought the terms, you know, poltergeist into English language sure. usage or, you know, they don't know the people who pioneered the, the concepts. So that's that what you we, were going over we today. We use today. Yeah. That's awesome. And uh, so it was a, that was a great presentation. Uh, so this uh, we've been to Alton a, a million times now. Yes. A million since <laughs> like Troy Taylor, who organizes it, was telling telling me that. See, I was thinking that I first started coming here in like 2000 but he he thought it was even before that that it, w- it might have been the late 90s well i know that you'd already known him in 2000 because we ran into him in new orleans in like may of 2000 All right. so we were on a family trip actually one time this is funny so we were at the um alice and i were on a family trip we went on every single ghost and vampire tour we could find in new orleans <laughs> at the time that's right now there are too many but at the time you there you could take a, like only a few of them we went on all of them, and then we go to Jean Lafitte's Blacksmith Shop, which is the oldest bar in New Orleans, yep. and also it's super haunted. Um, like people see ghosts in the fire. There's like a there's a fireplace in the middle of Jean Lafitte's, and it's not really a big bar. Like Jean Lafitte's is a small place. It's got a bunch of um, a bunch of seating outside, but it's, it's, a, it's a tiny place. And there's a fireplace right in the middle. And people will see like weird shapes and ghosts in the fireplace of Jean Lafitte, like. Um, and he also was a very famous pirate uh, in the uh, late 18th century and early 19th century. So anyway, we're standing in line because I want to get a drink at the oldest bar in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. And as we stand in line, we just randomly, our, Allison's like, I think I know that guy. Right behind Troy Taylor, who runs this event. And he also runs the um, American Hauntings, the Haunted America Convention that happens in Alton, Illinois. Alton is about, I don't know, 25 or 30 minutes from St. Louis. It's yeah, right across the Mississippi from St. Louis. Mm-hmm. And so um, we've, we've done several different podcasts from his conventions. But it's just a random thing is that, so by 2000, you already knew him well enough that you're like, that's Troy Taylor. And so you guys knew each other. So yes, okay, you've yeah. been coming here since the late nineties, and which basically makes you nine thousand years old. <laughs> I I'm know, talking to Methuselah, but, but he's also nine thousand years old. Right. So it is, it is. I feel like I'm sitting here in this hotel room on a couch next to Mel Brooks, the two thousand year old <laughs> man, telling me about all the stuff that happened in the late nineties. Anyway, so we love this convention. Um, if you guys are into the paranormal, you have read Troy Taylor's work. And so we had a good time today. Allison delivered a good presentation. And then they, they did their podcast, the American Hauntings podcast. Um, people that have been in the podcast before, uh, Tobias from the Singular Fort, Fortian Society was there doing a, um, a presentation. He's been on our podcast before. And uh, they also had a very interesting tour guide from Louisville. Kentucky to yeah. tell to tell about a homeless guy getting stabbed. So <laughs> no, he got you, bludgeoned with you, a you, hammer. Well, that's like, right. Bang, so, bang, Maxwell. 
<laughs> it was one of those stories. <laughs> but it's a pretty good story. So I can't wait to go back to Louisville and take the Louisville Ghost Walk so that I can get bang banged by Maxwell. Uh, that's right. But so that was just like the speakers. But it was a really positive event where they raised a bunch of, they had a bunch of stuff for charity. Yeah, it was free. All you had to do was bring in um, some non perishable food items. So there was just a ton of donations today, like a mountain of donations. So that was a really positive thing. Right. So the reason we wanted to do something from Alton, Illinois and talk about Alton, Illinois is number one is that Alton, Illinois has something we've talked about a little bit on the podcast before when we talked with um, Seth Breedlove of the Small Town Monsters series. He did uh, a show called Terror in the Skies. Yeah. And Allison, you were in Terror in the Skies, yep. but not, in the, and so was Troy. And so in Terror in the Skies, they talk about this, like, Piasaw bird is what they call it, but it's, it's a glyph. Is it just a glyph, yeah, a petroglyph? It's a, um, it's a pictograph, actually. Oh, a it's, pictograph. Yes. Thank you, Professor. Yes, yes. Tell well, me about the pictograph uh, again. <laughs> well, it's a pictograph because it's a painting on um, the one of the limestone bluffs, uh, but it, here in, in Alton, Illinois. And it's a very large painting um, of a huge winged creature, and it's been dubbed the Piasaw Bird. But as I found out in my research, it is not a bird at all. And um, well, well, we're going to yes, get to that. We'll get but to that. This episode <laughs> is about giant birds that do yes. attack. And we wanted to talk about the Piasaw bird because Alden is famous for this. Um, they've redone the pictograph on the side of the bluff. Yes, many times. But you go see it. It just looks like a big monster picture on the side of the bluff. It's Yeah, it's a big monster picture. And, you know, originally it was a big monster pic picture. Well, we'll talk about what that monster was. But in saying that, that doesn't mean that there aren't monster birds flying in the skies of Illinois and other states like Wisconsin right. there's, and Texas. There's monster birds over your house tonight. Yes. And what they can't... Don't go outside. Right. Beca after dark. <laughs> right, they're just going to eat you alive. That's right. Um, but the thing is, you know, we should talk a little bit about the Thunderbird. Because yes. that is kind of where I think a lot of our ideas of where monster birds come from is this uh, American Indian legend of the Thunderbird. And so when I grew up, I thought the Thunderbird was just a sweet car. And I thought I could get one and pick up some nice looking ladies in my sweet <laughs> Thunderbird car. But Allison, what's a little like, what do you know about the Thunderbird? Well, OK, so I for 13 years taught at a native school. And so that's where I derive my learning about the Thunderbird, because uh, the Thunderbird is, of course, this large bird, um, you know, like a monster bird. Uh, I mean, everybody's got that right, that it's a bird of huge dimensions, right? Sure. And it's like it's like Big Bird from Sesame Street. <laughs> no, but it's, flying. It's right? nothing like it's that. Like it's Big Bird from Sesame Street doesn't fly. No, no, no. But it's not, you know, big, puffy and yellow like that. Okay. I mean it's okay. it's it's a formidable uh creature. It's okay. big and it it was called the Thunderbird because it was associate, associated with thunderstorms and lightning and thunder um, as um, being in some way caused by this beast. Okay. And, and so it's funny because on one of the haunted history tours um, that are part of American Ghost Walks is in a place called Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. And when I was asking Linda Godfrey, actually, Linda Godfrey, who the the woman who gave us the beast of Bray Road, or who reported on it. Yes. Um, she, you know, she lives near Lake Geneva, and I was asking her if she knew any ghost stories. And the first thing she was saying was that Lake Geneva is the place where they thought that the Thunderbird battled its mortal enemy, the Water Panther. And yes. so when, the, when storms would roll in over, now this is a fairly big lake, about, I'd say 50 miles north of Chicago, between Chicago and Milwaukee, it's a it's a fairly big like it's a vacation spot. It's where all of the um, like rich Chicagoans moved in the middle of the 19th century after the Great Chicago Fire. Um, after that happened in 1871, a lot of um, wealthy Chicago families like the Wrigleys of of gum fame of Wrigley <laughs> Field fame, like the Maytags uh, of the dishwasher fame, and 
um, what was it? Westinghouse. Anyway, it's what? It, it, it's no. It's it's the Wrigleys, Maytags, and uh, these rich Chicago families who were, become very famous, including the guy they named Maxwell Street days after Robert Maxwell. They all moved up to Lake Geneva because their houses burned down in Chicago. Wow! And so this became a like a vacation spot and a playground for the rich. And so now it is still a vacation spot, even though most of those families have sold the houses and they're now museums and things like that. But it's a very haunted place. And part of that goes all the way back to the legends about the lake where the Thunderbird, when the the storms would roll in, the Thunderbird would fight the water panther in the bays of Lake Geneva. Yeah. So what's interesting about the Thunderbird is, although it's huge, I mean, it's powerful. It's fucking it's, huge lightning. It, it shoots lightning out of its eyes. We got three sizes. <laughs> you know, when it shoots lightning out of its eyes, I mean, that sounds scary. But um, in the tradition of at least, uh, you know, many of the native cultures of this area. Right. And we're talking um, about this area. We're talking about Illinois, Wisconsin. Yeah, we're and talking maybe about even, the woodland. Maybe even um, Minnesota, but we don't know if we trust them. The, the woodland tribes. Um, so... Their their idea of the Thunderbird is as more of a protective influence. So the school where I worked, um, what we would do every spring is we had a spirit pole, which is a, a large um, straight pine pole um, that has different offerings on the top. It's not and like the Festivus pole. No, no. Okay, but, but it's the a, spirit pole, what kind of offerings but, at the top, though? I'm interested in that. Like, what? Uh, Well, they'd be like... a little tobacco pouches uh, in various colors so the school that were tied it to wasn't the, a zero tolerance tobacco policy no at the school. no because we use tobacco in a sacred way oh cool yeah nobody smoked tobacco although i did smoke a peace pipe but um oh, you listen, know nobody dur- smoked dur- dur- during it was a definitely ceremony. zero tolerance except for me during when a I ceremony smoked a fat peace pipe dur- <laughs> during a ceremony but uh so you know that that would be tied to the top, okay. and and so every spring we would rededicate it. We'd refresh the pole and the offerings, and then we'd have a big ceremony around it to rededicate the pole for the upcoming storm season. And then the ceremony was to ask the Thunderbird for protection from the coming storms. And, and I love it, and, and, and I tell you why I love it. Because I used to think that ceremonies were stupid. Okay. No, I mean, I just did. Yeah. I thought like, okay, even if it was a wedding or um, a baptism. So like, you weren't a fan of ritual? No, I wasn't a fan of ritual because I thought rituals didn't mean anything. I thought intent and belief. Okay, so kind of like this. So in Salem's Lot, when the vampire comes at the like the priest character, and I'm talking about the movie... Not the book, because I never read the book. Um, but you know that it's like this blue, nasty vampire in Salem's Lot. He comes with the priest character, and the priest holds up his cross, and he's like, "You have no power over me, or whatever." And the vampire's like, "It doesn't work if you don't believe." And then he just eats him, right? Or sucks his blood, or does whatever vampires do, which is bad. And um, I always—that's how I felt about ritual. In that rituals are just something that people do when they don't believe. That belief is what matters. And the ritual of like holding up the cross in front of the vampire, obviously I'm talking about a Stephen King thing from the 1970s. But I just didn't, I thought that rituals were empty. Until when doing the research and talking to different people when, about magic or about your belief and how you make changes in your life. Um, or about how you form habits. I would say that's another way. It's like how you form habits is a big one too. And so how you're forming habits is you go through the ritual. You do it even when you're not 100% convinced of everything. You know, you don't need to floss all your teeth every day to have great teeth. But if you floss, at least you're doing it. Eventually, you'll be somebody with clean teeth or whatever. And so... I am now a believer in ritual over even belief because I think ritual creates the belief and I think ceremony creates the belief where I used to think it was the other way around. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I would say 20 years ago, if you'd have said, well, we have this ceremony, we dedicate it, and it's for protection against the storms, I'd be like, ha, 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 ha. You know, I'd be like, you guys are ridiculous. What <laughs> kind of, why are you wasting the kids' time with that? You should be teaching them about science. They need to get jobs. And now I'm like, I think that's a beautiful thing. 
I think the ceremony and I think going through the entire, like the pole and the offering and everyone focusing their intention on something like that is a powerful and beautiful thing. And and then that pole throughout the year was a focus of our intention and and uh, a place where the spirits could congregate and be honored. Right. I just, I'm just saying, everything that I thought about the world was right, like that smart people were in charge or whatever, it's all wrong. <laughs> yeah. It was all, I was yeah, completely yeah, yeah. incorrect. Right. So, okay. okay. So, so the Thunderbird yes. is good, not bad. I, with the tradition, <laughs> the tradition that you've worked with. Right. And, and so uh, that would be in particular um, the Oneida, but not just the Oneida, but the whole uh, Haudenosaunee grouping, which includes the Mohawk and so forth. So, you know, many of our listeners will know them as the Iroquois. So sure. let's just say... All of the Iroquois believed in, a, you know, a thunderbird that was benevolent. And, and I just so thought for a second, because I was so thinking, like, oh, the Iroquois Confederacy. Yes. But originally I thought the Iroquois Conspiracy. And I'm like, yeah. Iroquois Conspiracy might be a cool name for, like, an Indian punk band. Yes, it would be very cool. Um, so anyway, the Iroquois, the uh, Menominee, um, and the Ojibwe, um, and probably, probably um, their Three Fires Alliance as well, which... Um, included the Potawatomi and the Ottawa. So many tribes of this area and, you know, extending all the way to New York because that was the um, originally where the Iroquois came yes. from. So many tribes of this area believe in the Thunderbird as benevolent. But I think think that's um, similar uh, among other tribes throughout the United States as well. So the, the um, American Indians tribes, they feel as benevolent, but... I would say that the news stories we found out about giant birds do not make them sound as benevolent <laughs> as we were led to believe. So the news stories, it wasn't um, the, thun the, the mystical thunderbird, the gigantic bird in the sky that would take on his mortal enemy, the water panther. Yeah. Like he was, he was good for humans. Right. But, but the water panther is not. Right. But the, but the thing is, but the gigantic birds that people saw in Texas. Um, oh, and in Illinois in the, um, the late 70s. Were not quite right. a, as, be, as benevolent. And I think we should go through a couple of these um, newspaper stories here and go over actually how non-benevolent <laughs> non uh, some of these giant birds were. Yeah, there's actually um, two uh, attacks that I found in 1976 in... Uh, Texas, uh, one that seemed less credible than the other, but um, one of the witnesses that claimed that he was attacked actually had some pretty severe injuries that were verified by a doctor. All right, so can you give us a little background? Like, what was that particular attack? Okay, so um, that one happened um, in uh, January of 1976. What city in Texas? In Eagle Pass, Texas. Eagle Eagle Pass, Texas sounds yep. pretty appropriate it for does. what we're talking it about does. here. It does, yeah. And uh, so this young man, um, 21 years old, uh, his name was uh, Francisco uh, uh, Magalenas, I believe the name is. Okay, so you're, we're butchering the last yes, name of Francisco. Yes, I hope not. Yeah, so Francisco claimed that he was in his backyard, and then suddenly this giant bird descended upon him, and he had uh, weird gouges, 8 to uh, 12 centimeters long, and from one half to one and one half centimeters deep okay. on the back no, portion one, of each shoulder. Number Okay. Okay, the back portion of each shoulder. Yes. All right, I like that already. Yes. So it's like it tried to pick him up. Right. In the classic kind of way. So that's a lot of fun. But what I don't understand is why in Texas, they'd be using some kind of European thing known as a centimeter. <laughs> well, that's... <laughs> Isn't this the Texas that, paper? That, that's oh, a good point. But all right. Remember, so let me tell you one thing. Well, We're going to go 100 <laughs> miles till we come up with the metric system. Well, remember, in the 70s, there was this big... Uh, this big push to convert to the metric system. It didn't take. That's right. But, no, but our dad was behind it. Yeah. Well, he was He was all like, we should definitely convert to the metric system. And I agree. Everything's in tens. It just makes sense. Yes, I agree. We should have. 
We should have done that. I ain't so going to we... have any of their little mouths. <laughs> so that we can uh, Them tiny collaborate e- easily with uh, people around the world who but all gu- use it. But guys, just think if you could say, <laughs> instead of uh, four and a half inches, you could say like nine centimeters. <laughs> okay. So let's get back to the point. The point is that- We're talking for, about big birds. For, yeah. Poor Francisco is like in his yard and this huge- uh, he described it as a, a six-foot-tall bat-like creature with a pig face and huge red eyes jumps on him from above and gouges into his back. Now, this was verified by a doctor named uh, Dr. Ar- Arturo Bales. Okay. Or, I don't know if it's Bales or whatever. whatever but Dr. Arturo. Dr. Arturo um, actually um, verified that you know, these cuts were real. And in, he he was uh, kind of uh, confounded about, you know, how they could have been made in any other way. What I think is interesting here is, like, I thought that when you first originally said, like, oh, we found a couple of big bird attacks. I was like, okay. And then it's just a guy that gets his butt kicked or whatever. Mm-hmm. Or, like, a kid that gets his butt kicked. Like, a bully beats him up on the way from school. Or maybe he writes a couple of checks that his butt can't cash kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And... Gets beaten up, and then he's got to be like, oh, man, I don't want to admit that I got beaten up. So, so I'm going to make up a big a bird, bird story? With a, with a pig face. I um, don't know. But how is he going to get the marks on his back? Yeah, so, I mean, that was interesting. Um, and, you know, the doctor felt that, that the witness was credible as well, that he, he really seemed actually freaked out about what happened. So, you know, he certainly believed the story. There were others that, that didn't. Uh, but, but the doctor who you know uh, was who this guy was sent to by police uh, seems to think that there was some something to this report. Now, what and, people didn't believe him? Okay, so so the actual uh, Captain Donald Smith um, of the police uh, said that it's just a matter of time before the the Big Bird story uh, from Megalena's is just proven and and he he said um i believe if you uh dig into some of our of your mexican customs your your voodoo and black magic any of those beliefs uh, some people believe satan or demons come out in the body of a bat with a bat face so he was saying that that um, you know what was seen was a product of this guy's imagination. Well, if that's the case, how did he get these right. verifiable wounds? It'd be like stigmata, otherwise. Like obviously, he gets so scared of some kind of <laughs> bird demon in his head that, like that, um, sores and and cuts develop on his back. But I think it's interesting though, because yeah. you first of all, the doctor's name is Arturo, yes. and the guy's you know it's Francisco, and then here comes. Good old Donald Smith. <laughs> right. well, I think it's just a matter of time before <laughs> this all gets disproven. Because if you come into these kind of Mexican customs, <laughs> black magic voodoo, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes. It's all a bunch of crap. Hooey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can you can totally uh You can hear him right, you can in, hear him right, right in the story. Um but there have been numerous reports that year in South Texas of a large bird. It was called the big bird and it was sighted <laughs> Big Bird's coming at you. Watch out by, Snuffle off against you shouldn't have ran out. Yeah, it's funny. That it was 76, so I mean, obviously Big, Snuffle- bird, Big bird was around. And Snuffleupagus was around. And yeah. the thing is, is that I know Snuffleupagus was supposed to originally be the imaginary friend on Sesame Street. Yes. And when we were kids, every time that Big Bird would be like, oh, I want to be my mammoth friend or whatever, Snuffleupagus, right. then he'd show up and Snuffleupagus would be gone like that. So number one, Snuffleupagus is the worst imaginary friend ever. Because yeah, every time like a... A farewell imaginary friend. Yeah, because every time Big Bird's like, oh, I want you to see my friend. You know, he's like, bah. And and now Snuffleupagus is just part of Sesame Street. So what is the lesson here? That if you believe in something long enough, it'll eventually, like your imaginary friends are real? It will manifest. Is Sesame Street trying to tell us something? Maybe. <laughs> imaginary so, friends are so, real. So maybe all that black magic voodoo hoodoo. Black magic um, voodoo hoodoo. Actually, all these Mexican customs. <laughs> actually turned into something real. <laughs> and um, there was a, another man in uh, Raymondsville, 
uh, Texas just a week prior to Francisco's report, who also reported being attacked. Um, but he described the creature as having a, a monkey face or an ape face. Okay, that, now that's yeah. interesting because yeah. now we have this. Okay, because when you think of a bird, you think of a beak, right? Yeah, you don't think of a pig face. But, no. you know, if it was kind of, a, you know, like a more of a bat-like creature. Right. A, yes. bat, a bat has a pig face because a bat's a mammal. So now we're not talking about a giant bird. Yeah, we're talking we're about talking a giant bat. A giant bat, yeah. <laughs> That's way scarier than a giant bird. Because yeah. a bird's like kind of stupid or whatever. Like a giant bat is smart. And, and you can echolocate your ass. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. A bird you can hide from as long as you can get around their weird eyes or whatever. Because they're right, right. on the sides of their head. Like the bat would just go boop, 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 and eat you. <laughs> that's right. So well, that, that's great, but that's interesting though too, because now we have the monkey face, and now we have the pig face. Right. So now it feels like we're going into a different territory. Than yeah, but not only that. Um, also, this Francisco guy um, apparently had some uh, evidence in his yard. Uh, so Donald Smith uh, said that when Magdalena's was released from the hospital police planned to interrogate him and hoped he would submit voluntarily to a polygraph test so what were the results i wonder but beyond that um he said several items this is a donald donald smith saying this he said several items including a piece of fur or feather was uh, found in the victim's yard and would be processed through a crime laboratory now um, we're talking about physical evidence. Right. I was going to say, there needs to be a book. Nick Redfern, you were out there. You were not listening yes. to this podcast right now. Where are you, Nick? But Nick Redfern lives in Dallas. And yeah, this is perfect. I was going to say, this What is be, he doing? He's worried about the men in black probably right now. <laughs> but um, so this would be the perfect thing for Nick Redfern because he could go to uh, Eagle Pass and he could be like, and he's an English guy. And whenever English people talk, we all, like Americans automatically <laughs> do whatever they want. They're like, oh, he's an English guy. We used to take orders from them, so we he, should probably still do it. He gets a pass because right. he's English. Right. He's like, can I, can I see those records, please? <laughs> and we're like, oh, yes, sir. You must be sophisticated. <laughs> I smell the blood of an Englishman. <laughs> um, so uh, what I think is interesting is that other people saw the bird, big bird. Yes. Um, people talked about, People reported to the police. Yes. They were like, holy crap, there's a bird out here. There's physical evidence on a man's body, and there is feathers. Yeah, or so fur. That's feather, interesting. Feathers or fur. Because feathers, if it's a bird, fur, if, if it's, it's a, a bat. bat. Yeah. So absolutely. something's going on in Texas in the 1970s. Yeah. Um, that's not ZZ Top. Yeah, and so the week before, this is um, uh, the other report of uh, an attack. Uh, the headline is, Man Tells of swooping attack in yard so, i just love these headlines man tells of swooping attacking like that doesn't draw your eye unless you're a weirdo like we are we're like swooping attack what's swooping attack yeah people? like most I people like, like hmm like who who doesn't just pass that over that's not an ap headline anyway this is the eagle pass news let's see that right right so this happened in um raymondville uh, and this was a week before the Eagle Pass thing. Yeah. Um, and so this was another person um, reporting that he had been attacked by this giant bird. And then earlier uh, that that month, uh, earlier in January, uh, other people were uh, reporting lots of you know big flying creatures in the lower Rio Grande Valley, including two police officers came forward and said they saw something strange. And this isn't just people saying that police officers are seeing right, something right, right. strange. This is, actually, this, this is actually... The cops, like, they saw something weird and right. they reported it. And it's being reported in the actual newspaper. So, um, so anyway, there's this guy, 28 years old, Armando Grimaldo... And First of all, I love the rhyming last name. Yeah, I like, great last name. My last name is Huberty, so I yes, don't want my that's, that's, I don't want my last name to rhyme. Thank you. I didn't um, want that last name <laughs> at all but, ever. But Armando Grimaldo is a yeah. totally sweet name. Yes. And anyway, that's the name. When I go to the bar after this podcast gonna... is done, I'll be like, <laughs> "Hello, girls." I am Armando Grimaldo. <laughs> they're gonna all swoon at your feet. <laughs> they're gonna they're gonna give me a swooping attack. That's right. So anyway, he claimed that this big black bird with big eyes and a monkey-like face attacked him and tore his jacket and shirt. 
and uh, the the man was taken to a local hospital um, for treatment and released after the hospital attendants could not find any trace of physical injury. Um, so he claimed to be attacked, um, but he didn't have physical evidence like a week later when Francisco was attacked and he had those weird wounds and apparently some physical evidence in his sure. yard. Right. So, so Armando might be a Johnny come lately. Uh, well, Armando was before. Okay. Yeah, he preceded Francisco's attack. So, so maybe uh, the big bird just got better at attacking. <laughs> right. uh, you know, maybe up. he just wasn't that efficient and, you know, ripped the shirt, grabbed onto the shirt, and then flew away. Now, in, interestingly, a year later, in um, 1970, uh, 77 um we would have the illinois uh, lawndale illinois um attempted abduction of marlon low by a giant bird-like creature and this and this was uh, not just reported by his mother and himself but you know many uh other neighbors who witnessed this giant bird picking up marlon uh, by his T-shirt, and they talk about, and that's what they talk about in *Terror in the Skies*, right? Yes, like the Marlon right. Lowen. So if you but guys they don't w- talk about stuff that happened in in other states preceding that attack. But if you want to see um, a reenactment, a reenact, right? Yeah. And it's pretty good. It's pretty fun. A reenact. I mean, not for Marlon or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Because how old is Marlon when he gets picked up? Uh, I don't know. I think about twelve. Actually, he's right. he's older. He's right. He's not like a baby or whatever. Because yeah, I think baby. about my three-year-old and like she's a toddler and yeah. she's she's maybe thirty some pounds or something like that. And uh, you think, well, an ostrich could pick her up. But <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, ostriches don't fly, though. <laughs> no, but I mean, like an ostrich could probably like an ostrich. That's a big bird. Well, you know, if you want to talk about birds picking people up, um, oh man. There are some really bad stories that really seem to happen. Uh, there was one um, from 1926 uh, when a, a giant condor was uh, reported in, uh, I believe it was Argentina. Buenos Aires. See. Oh, it was, yes, Buenos Aires, right. So um, this little uh, two-year-old baby, um, his name Oh, God, is, you're breaking my heart. I can't, yeah, I can't handle the baby stuff anymore. Yeah, sorry. Uh, his name is Lazaro Delga- uh, Delgado. Lazaro Delgado. Lazaro Delgado? Lazaro. L A Z A R O. Lazaro. Lazaro, okay. Lazaro Delgado was a two year old boy, and this uh, great condor of the Andes carried him away to a cave. And ate him. So oh, hold yes, on there. Yes, this is bad. It's a bad story. <laughs> that is a that's a horrific story. Yeah. So, okay. So, I mean, that's something though that you're like, okay, it, it, it's one of those classic stories. First of all, it happens in the 1920s, which yeah. we're at the height of Orientalism, right? Yeah. Because we're at the height of Egyptology. We're at the height of the name and movies, the Egyptian. The name and movie theaters, like the. Yeah, but Oriental. this is the, the the condor is is from the Andes. I know, but I'm just saying it's we're talking about places out of the country, and this yeah. is an age of American journalism where when they were talking about things, they were trying to shock you with what happened in foreign cultures. I think about these stories like Faces of Death or the kind of VHS movies that they had in the 1980s where you'd be like, "You'll never believe that they eat dogs in Asia, but we're going to show you on tape." And right. you're like, oh my god, you know, in Faces of Death, they had this whole thing where they beat the monkey to death with a with a, a hammer, Aww. and they eat its brains and stuff, just like in, in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. What do they, you know, he goes to eat in India, and what's the scene that we're all grossed out by when here comes dessert, and the guy goes, my favorite chilled monkey brains, like yeah. it's right. So you have this idea. You have this idea of a foreign culture as something that's terrifying. The Andes becomes a place where giant condors take toddlers to their death. Well, and maybe it is a trumped up story like that. I, you know, I can't say. I'm just saying when Donald Smith but, comes out and, and he's like, and Donald Smith's like, well, we did find a feather. 
Yeah, like, but that, that holds us in the other story. I know, but that's what I mean. That's like it is a different feeling. I feel like a lot of the stuff from the and this is happens, guys, when we're doing research for haunted history tours and research for the podcast. When you look back at newspapers from certain eras. Yeah. It's not a, always the most reliable. No, of course <laughs> not always the most reliable. Like the standards of like people talk about fake news today like it's something that was invented in the two thousand and tens. Like fake news um, yellow journalism and sensationalism, like they used to have tabloid style stories in the regular newspaper because it would sell more newspapers. And so that's all I mean. Now, I'm not saying the Buenos Aires story isn't Trump, you know, isn't the real thing, but it's such a horrific kind of tale. Yeah. That it feels like the kind of thing you would read as, a, well, you better watch out for your two-year-old or the condor's going to eat him. Yeah, and it's sad because um, he was in uh, the backyard with his little brother, his little five-year-old brother, Martin. And so they're they're in the backyard together, and then the parents come back out to retrieve him. And then, you know, little Martin is, like, babbling about this giant bird and they're like you know where's uh lazaro or lazaro uh martin and and (laughs) martin and lazaro yeah martin and lazaro i'm sorry i'm very tired but um you know where is he and you know the little kids babbling that a big bird took him and then um relatives actually go to the nearby hills and find the condor's cave and are able to retrieve the two-year-old's body. Oh God, I I can't even I can't handle it. It's too sad. Yeah, it's really horrible. But um, that I mean, let's have a happier story. Okay. And let's talk about the Piazza Bird. Of Piazza. Oh, oh my say, God! I, I always say it wrong. You always say. How it have wrong. I been saying it wrong forever? The it's pi- the pizza bird. It's the pizza. The pie I saw bird, I really am embarrassed well, about that. Well, don't be, because that whole thing is made up, that whole name and everything like that. So. What do you mean the pie I saw is made up? Well, okay, so, oh, man. Okay, so let's start with where the pie I saw actually came from. So Jacques Marquette comes. Wait, who's Jacques Marquette? Uh, Father Marquette was an explorer uh, that uh, came uh, to... The United States, Father Jacques Marquette. Uh, I'm and assuming he's French, right? Louis Joliet came oh, for. Oh man, he, he was with a guy named Louis Joliet. Yes, came for Obviously. the for the French crown to survey the lands, find escargot uh, in, in weird places in America, and um, they came through the uh, Midwest. And in 1673, they came through this area, Alton, Illinois, which is now Alton, Illinois. And Alton, Illinois, and, like close to St. Louis. On the Mississippi River, yes, it is, you know, the the middle of the country. So when you think yeah, about so the United States, like, you think about if you threw a dart and hit the middle, it'd be somewhere around here. So they are, they are traversing the river in canoes, and as they go by one of the bluffs, they see uh, this this depiction. Uh, it's rock art. It's a painting. So that's why it's a. A pictograph rather than a petroglyph, or petroglyph is carved, and a pictograph is uh, painted. So they see this uh, pictograph in very large form. It's a giant painting uh, as they're going by this bluff, and it's way up there. And it actually has two creatures, which um, Marquette described in his journal um, as you know being very fierce looking. They look like tigers. Um, they have horns on their head, like those of a deer. They're uh, covered with scales. They have a fish's tail. But you know what's interesting? That they don't have wings. No. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> so they, they don't, don't have, have wings. They don't have wings. So the original Piasa bird was not a bird at all. And then um, the uh, actual sketch that Marquette did um, in his journal um of the creatures uh, that were depicted was lost for a long time until in 1992, a French researcher, you know, rediscovered um, the image of uh, the, the, what became known as the Piasa around um, 
the area of Alton, Illinois, on a map made by Joliet. And so the idea is, um, okay, we don't have the original sketch, but um, what was depicted on Joliet's map uh, was from uh, from Marquette's original drawing. It was based on that. Sure. Yes. And, okay. So this idea that these two French explorers are coming through the Mississippi. Oh, mm-hmm. we go down the Mississippi. Right. Um, and they're going down in canoes, which is pretty brave. It's very perilous. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So pretty tough. They come down. They see a painting. And today, if you look at the painting, it looks like, I mean, almost, the painting today almost looks like one of those Assyrian bulls with wings. When I think about how the the Piasaw bird looks, when you have pictures, and we've put these pictures on our podcast before because the Piasaw, because it can all in a bunch, has been a recurring theme. But this is the first time where we're saying, hey man, it ain't no bird. Yeah, it's not a bird. I mean, if it was a bird, then Marquette in his very detailed description, would have referred to it as having wings. And also, um, its positioning, um, being able to be seen by people traversing the river uh, right before uh, a big big area of whitewater uh, is telling because uh, it actually was meant to be a warning uh, to travelers that a bad part of the river is coming up, a dangerous confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers is coming up in just a few miles. Um, so watch out because uh, these creatures will drown you if you don't. Okay, and so what what creatures are we talking about that might drown you? Yes. So it's not a bird. No. So it's not the Thunderbird. It's not the Thunderbird. Was the, was the Thunderbird it's, in the legends of the people of this area? Yes. But... And there are other places nearby that actually have uh, Thunderbird petroglyphs. But the the pictograph of the original Piasa, which is not its name. Um, see, it gets so complicated, <laughs> you know. Uh, but well, who named it? Okay, who named it Piasa? Okay, so um, later on, um, John Russell was just this angle guy. He doesn't guy. sound like a French or per- Indian. No, is Professor... Uh, John Russell declared in 1836 to have uncovered the local native legend of the fearsome Piasa. The word Piasa, he claimed, means the bird that devour, devours men. And he had this whole story um, about uh, the Piasa and um, it, it uh, you know, rampaging um, and eating Indians and this. Uh, so did he? Yes. He said he got that from the local Indians. Yes. And this is the but, first time people talked about the Piasa in lore. Right. Was from John John Russell's um, story, and everybody just took his word for it. Okay, so could it have been like the local Indians taking the piss or whatever? I think it's just John Russell making up a story. Sure, to get attention. Yes, and and so he called it the the Piasa, but there's no evidence to support what he would what he said, and uh, there is no word um, for a giant giant bird. Um, linguistically, experts in the local um, Illini. Miami language uh, say that the word Piasa actually has nothing to do with Thunderbirds or underwater panthers. Uh, Piasa actually uh, comes from another word, um, Piasa, which refers to supernatural dwarves. So the actual word um, was taken by um, John Russell. He misunderstood what it meant and attributed it to, you know, some kind of fearsome bird. But it actually uh, comes from an, another part of the legend. The legend um, associated with the original pictograph is even weirder than you would, might imagine. And it involves two supernatural dwarves. And that's where the word Piasa came into all of this. Wait, what do the, the dwarves do? Okay, so, all right. Now... The Piasa is actually, as you were saying, the water panther. Remember we were talking about how the water panther battles the thunderbird? Yes. Okay. So that 
um, ideology existed in this area as well. And so, you know, the Thunderbird would come come through and, you know, take care of um, the Misipiju, which is, was uh, the Ojibwe name, um, for the Water Panther so that the Water Panther would stop drowning people. <laughs> So the Thunderbird would actually come to people's rescue. Okay, so, um, but the Thunderbird isn't in um, the original story to go with the, with this original story that uh, went with the, the pictographs. Um, so there's a story from the Illini about a trickster who was captured by the underwater panther. And he's locked up with a bunch of un- other victims um, under the water. And so the the monster has this larder filled with all these people that he's devouring at his leisure. And then after... As you do. Yes. And after one of the hapless uh, captives is devoured, um, the the beast falls asleep. So this this trickster... Like you almost fell asleep after eating the cheesecake tonight. Yes. I'm, I'm still suffering the effects, as you probably can tell, of too much cheesecake. Um, so anyway... Um, after uh, the beast falls asleep, the water panther falls asleep, uh, things are looking pretty bleak for the captives, but uh, the trickster manages uh, to stuff the sleeping water panther with gunpowder and eventually blow it up. After Wait, which, are they still underwater at this time? Yeah, they're still... Because ru- blowing st- something up underwater... I know, okay, but... Suspend your disbelief, people. So, suspend your disbelief. But the important thing here... Is that after the creature is gone, the trickster get this gets this monster, uh, this monster's cool underwater lair for his very own. So he's like digging it, that using it as a swinging bachelor pad. Sure. That is until two spooky supernatural dwarves come out of nowhere and raid his new digs and unceremoniously kick him out. Oh man! So that's where the dwarves come in, and all around this area in uh, the St. Louis area and in uh, Illinois, um, you will you will find little footprints that were carved into rocks around this area, and those those tiny footprints are supposed to represent these dwarves. The Piasaw. Yes. So the Piasaw are actually the dwarves, and the. Um, the pictograph uh, was the water panther, and it was a warning to travelers who are traveling on the river that there's rough water coming up, and if you're not careful, um, the the piasa is going to pu- pull you underneath to his uh, watery uh, lair and eat you. Well, and that's <laughs> and we've talked about the water panther before because the water panther is something that people have discussed about. Um, the drownings that happened in La Crosse, Wisconsin, yes, along the Mississippi River, right, and La Crosse and Minneapolis, mysterious, very mysterious drownings. And there's, you know, and interestingly enough, in in uh, there's a Fox River that goes from uh, north of the Illinois border from by where we grew up. The Fox River actually passed by the neighborhood that Allison and I grew up in, and it went all the way down into Illinois. And when you look at the drownings that have happened in the Fox River over the same period as the drownings that happened in the Mississippi River in La Crosse, more famously known as the the Smiley Face Murders, um, you might have heard that on Coast to Coast, is that there's just about as many people that drown in the Fox River as drown in the Mississippi. But because the um, news agencies are different and because some of it happens in Wisconsin and some of it happens in Illinois, nobody connects it. Because if a story happens in northern Illinois, we don't hear about it in southern Wisconsin. And in southeastern Wisconsin, if they're not in the Milwaukee TV market, they're not going to hear about that in northern Illinois because they're in the Chicago TV market. So it's an interesting... So it's the water panther is... He's out there, man. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And I mean, what's, what's interesting is seeing, is, is seeing the actual drawing uh, that came from that Joliet... Uh, map the, it's called um, the Franklin map um, and it was drawn um, by Jean Baptiste Franklin but credited and signed by uh, Marquette's companion Joliet and um, the creature depicted on the map um, near the the site of present-day Alton um, has 
horns and antlers and that long fishing a fish's tail as described but of course no wings but the other interesting thing that it has is it has jaguar spots on it and i used to think i mean the whole concept that like when you hear the words underwater panther i thought boy that's that sounds dumb i mean what kind of right what, what does, my cats hate water. right cats hate water but what I didn't realize is that the jaguar um, may have um, made its way uh, deeper into North America during that time period. It's a typical range today uh, extends um, to Arizona. Uh, but it's not beyond the pale to think that that um, it might have, you know, before uh, the march of civilization, it might have made its way. Um, to other areas of North America and been witnessed by Native people as this mysterious creature. Uh, it's a feline-type creature hunting, a panther, hunting in the water, which would, would have been a strange thing. And um, so perhaps that's where uh, the whole legend of, of Miss Apiju derived originally was from... Uh, was the, from the jaguar this, making this it up jaguar, to North America, right? And because I I had not known that this original drawing um, of Marquette, and then later you know copied by um, an artist commissioned by Joliet, would would show actual jaguar spots. I mean that kind of blew my mind and and made it made the water panther make sense to me finally and i was like oh it's a jaguar there you go it was right in front of your face the whole time right what cat regularly hunts in water it's the jaguar and there you go so like there is i mean think about it if bef like there was uh un like enough climate it was warm enough there weren't enough people or cities or something like that absolutely an animal that is as far away as arizona could come up another a few hundred miles well, not a few hundred, maybe, oh, yeah, you know, 500, 600 miles and get to Illinois. But also, the people were very moving around and nomadic, too. So we think about yeah. we think about the native people. You didn't just, like, move. Like, we live in Alton, Illinois. A lot of the people we talk to today are from the area, and they've been living here their whole lives, and their family's here. And if you're a, uh, if you're a Native American tribe in you know, 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago, chances of you moving from place to place with the weather and crops and right. where the game are. Yeah. Um, so you could, they could have been in Arizona. They could have seen the Jaguar and they could move up here and then still be worried that there's going to be Jaguars up here. So don't get in the water, kids. Right. Or you know what's going to happen. The condor is going to come and eat your two-year-old. <laughs> well, okay. Not sure about the condor part. But... Yeah, I mean it's it's um, entirely possible. Well, so let's say the the jaguar doesn't extend its range, um, but the people do, or the people uh, also talk to other uh, other inhabitants of other areas of North America and hear about this strange creature, this feline creature that hunts in the water, and so maybe that's how. Uh, the legend was derived was from other contact with other tribes where um, the jaguar range uh, was more common. Well, and then if you take a couple of things, you take the eagle, you know, a majestic creature, obviously the bald eagle, they made it the country's bird or whatever, and Uncle mm -hmm. Sam and all that kind of business. And then, you know, you mythicize it. You put a myth behind it of the Thunderbird and these gigantic birds and they're powerful creatures and you, yeah. you, you, you make it part of your culture's myths and then you take something that's fearsome on the other end. Like you're having a swim. Like mm -hmm. when you don't have a bathtub, you got to swim in a river to try to bathe off, you know, yep. or go to the bathroom or all those other kind of things. Well, let's say you pinch in a loaf in the river and the jaguar comes up, run for your life. That's, yeah, that's right. the most terrifying. Like in, when you're at your most uh, vulnerable, here comes the water panther to drown you. Absolutely. And so, of course, that be that can become a myth in itself. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so uh, you know, there, there's real things behind um, these mythical ideas, and you know, it doesn't have to be 
uh, you know, a mysterious monster, but maybe it could be. Uh, you know, I'm not saying that there are no mysterious monsters because uh, on the theme of talking about large creatures in the air, we have someone in our own family who uh, told us a story. Well, that's right. Decades ago now. and My godfather. Yes. So and he's not like a wacko. Yeah, he's... Um, he's a vet. He's a vet, yeah. He's a responsible person. Right, he's got four kids. He's a good dad. Like, yep. all these kind of things. And he doesn't have all these wild stories. He has this one weird story. And this is like maybe the late 90s. And yep. we're having uh, Christmas at our aunt's house. And this is in the Bayview area, Milwaukee. And it's, it's something we've done since we were kids. And we're all in the basement. And everybody's together at Christmas and Christmas Eve. Late unwrapping night. gifts. That's uh, what we did. Santa comes. Santa and comes. We all unwrap our gifts But together. the thing is, my godfather, Kevin, then delivers the best gifts we ever got. Yes. Because, see, what Mike gave me was this big book of UFO sightings. And so um, my... Um, cousin and his godfather uh, noticed this book and said oh my gosh I didn't know you were into UFOs and I'm like yeah we're total weirdos. <laughs> well, I was going to say <laughs> like we're the part of the family that everybody's like are they coming? <laughs> yeah. So how did you not know that we're total weirdos? So so anyway he's like oh well I have to tell you my story and we're like well did you see a UFO and he's like no I saw a dragon <laughs> Yeah, straight up. Yeah. And so that was like one of the best uh, stories he could ever tell us. And if you want to hear it in his own words, yeah. I'll put the YouTube video in and the show notes on othersidepodcast.com slash 284. And you can hear um, you can hear it in his own words. But basically, he it was during the birth of his son. Yeah. So September 21st, uh, 1988. He's at um, Elmbrook. Uh, Elmbrook uh, Memorial Hospital, which is in Brookfield, Wisconsin, and uh, this uh, this uh, hospital is on on top of a bluff, and it has um, some some uh, ten foot bay windows on the upper floor. And the, the, uh, Brookfield, the Brookfield area in the yeah. Waukesha County, they have there's a ton of hills around there. In yeah. fact, there's a there's a specific hill in Waukesha nearby uh, called Tower Hill where very famously used to have ghost hunts in 1900 and 1901. They'd really? See, they'd see weird lights in the tower on Tower Hill, like weird blue lights. And so it was a popular thing um, for young people to go ghost hunting at Tower Hill, uh, not too far away from where this happened. Wow. Like, like five miles from where this happened. So, I did not know that. It was, one of the, it was also on one of the hills in Waukesha County. Yeah, so um, this uh, normal hospital, Brookfield's... Uh, Elmbrook Memorial Hospital. So he's up there in the waiting room awaiting the birth of his first child. And he's just, you know, staring out the window and, you know, nervously waiting for the arrival of his son uh, when he sees a black form dipping in and out of the, the clouds. And uh, this catches his attention. And he thought, well, if this is an airplane, it's in trouble because it's flying dangerously low. And so he stops. You know what he's doing? He's just sitting there drinking a coffee and um, watches this this object. And then as he watches it uh, emerge from the clouds, he suddenly realizes that it's not an airplane. It, it looks very much like a, a large bird. And he actually drew me a, a sketch and uh, the sketch, um, the the face of it looks very much like a pterodactyl. It's basically it, just Game of Thrones. And it was it wasn't a it wasn't like um, uh, it didn't have feathers. It was more had leathery wings, like you know we were talking about maybe a bat like creature. But uh, the face that he drew was very much very pterodactyl like. Or and, a but he also said it was the size of like a Piper Cub airplane. Yes. So, so it wasn't just a large bird. It was a Bird, bird. Yeah, so um, that's a small plane, but it's it's huge when you're thinking of bird sizes. And and what's really interesting to me is uh, I know we talked about this on the podcast before because um, when we had said stress breed love on talking about his documentary Terror in the Skies, um, we mentioned you know several of the stories from this 1948 
flap throughout Illinois where these huge birds were sighted. And um, one of the witnesses' descriptions startled me because the the witness description said it was the size of a Piper Club plane. Oh. Yes. It was like, wow, that's just, that's crazy how that matched up. And we're talking about something that's, um, so we're talking about southeastern Wisconsin where this happened. Yes. Southeastern Wisconsin, it's, you know, a half an hour away from the border, from Illinois. So I, I was going to say a an Illinois pterodactyl could have slipped over uh, and uh, scared our cousin. Yeah, absolutely. But, I mean, what do you do with that when somebody tells you a story like that? And You laugh and you say you don't believe them. But we didn't. No, of because, course not, because it was an awesome story and we believe them. And, and we did believe him because he did seem unnerved by it. Yeah, and he's like, I saw it, a terror. Like, he... He seemed like it was one of those quizzical things that happens to you, and and you just don't know what to do with it. And, and he, he was and he's he was not sh- alone. Yeah, he was sharing it with us on Christmas, just because he he saw that we'd be open. Your phone book. Yeah. And so, if you guys have a crazy story, you can share it with us too. And yeah, we would love that. We would love it. We live for your stories. Absolutely. Uh, find us at uh, at Other Side Talk on Twitter, or obviously OtherSidePodcast.com. Um, but if you want to hear that story in his own words, we'll have that on this, and as, law, as well as the links to some of these newspaper articles, so yes. you can see how they wrote about it themselves uh, when when Big Bird attacks. <laughs> uh, so, th- thanks for joining us, Allison. Uh, let's sign off from Alton, Illinois. Hey, everybody! Thank you for joining us. Winston Churchill famously said, "He who controls the skies controls the war." And as earthbound creatures, there's something extra terrifying about being attacked from the sky. Airborne predators pick their targets from far away and swoop in to snatch their prey. The stories of these giant bird attacks are certainly arbitrary and horrifying. It makes us realize just how precarious and precious our life is when we live on a knife edge of randomness. Whether it's cancer, tsunamis, car accidents, or gigantic condor kidnappings, we all live under a constant threat. And that threat is the title of this week's Sunspot song, Death from Above. for listening to today's episode. You can find us online at othersidepodcast.com. Until next time, see you on the other side. And an extra thanks to our Patreon community. Thank you for showing us that you're really into what we do and for helping us to 
continue creating content for the podcast, writing new songs, recording them and making videos and researching all of the different paranormal topics that we love to cover. And the bonus shout goes to Dr. Ned, who is a member of our community at the executive producer level. Ned, thank you so much for your support. And we love giving you this extra shout out because we really, truly do appreciate you. Now, February is coming to an end soon, and that means it's almost time for our monthly hangout. So members, please make sure you check the Facebook group and also check your Patreon emails from us because we'll be sending out the details for when and where. Well, (laughs) it's pretty much from the comfort of your own home, but definitely we'll send you the details of when and how to connect with us for that hangout. We're looking forward to it. Thank you so much for listening to the very, very end, and I hope that you have an awesome week. Ha 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 You know, I'd be like, you guys are ridiculous.